Well, thank you for coming out on a uh, snowy day today. We appreciate your effort to do so. And I am very proud to stand here side by side with Gene Shaheen, uh, governor, former governor of New Hampshire, a biennial budget and appropriation state. And my seat made at the State of the Union on Tuesday, I want to acknowledge to all of you that was not a date situation. That was a continuation of our effort to work together on the serious problem of spending in the budget and debt in the Congress. And I was pleased to sit with her on Tuesday night. I'm pleased to join with her today in the introduction of the Biennial Budget and Appropriations Act. You know, the definition of insanity is to continue to do the same thing over and over and over again and expect a, a different result. Uh, we've lost our discipline in Washington. We've become a Congress of omnibus appropriations and lack of oversight or no oversight at all. The disciplines that are in the law are now avoided or not even paid any attention to. What this legislation does is it changes the paradigm and it changes the process by which we budget, we appropriate, and we do oversight. As you read the bill, you'll notice it primarily changes dates in the existing 1974 law that we operate under today. But it has a fundamental underlying principle that's very important. You appropriate in the first year of each Congress and you do oversight in the second year, which means in odd years you're appropriating and in even numbered years when you're running for re-election, you're doing oversight to find savings and accountability of existing spendings. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have an even numbered year debate for members of Congress where when they go home they're not talking about the bacon they're getting ready to bring home through appropriating, they're talking about the savings they found to fund programs in the future. And that's what this is really all about. The Deficit and Debt Commission in its recommendations recommended that we look at the processes by which we do scoring and the processes we, where we do budgeting and the processes through which we do appropriating and to change the paradigm so we can change the result. I believe the Isaacson Shaheen Biennial Budget and Appropriations Act does exactly that and I'm honored to be joined by the former Governor of New Hampshire and my colleague in the United States Senate, Gene Shaheen. Thank you very much, Senator Isaacson. Um, I'm very pleased to be working with Senator Isaacson on this legislation. As you've heard and those of you who have been around here for a while know, this is an issue that he's been working on for some time. I'm new here. I'm only in my third year. But you don't have to be here very long to recognize that if we're going to deal with our debt and our deficit, we've got to begin to do some things differently. Um, the news this morning was not good in terms of the increased amount of this country's debt. And it's a reminder of why it's important for us to take a look not just at the tough decisions around spending and taxes, but also at the process by which we make decisions. Um, as Senator Isaacson said, um, the process right now is not working very well. Since 1980, we've only had two budgets that have been completed on time. So in 30 years, only two budgets. Every president since Ronald Reagan has said we need to take a look at um, the budgeting process and change to a biennial budget. Um, I think Senator Isaacson laid out very well the opportunities that exist with a biennial budget. The first year would give Congress and federal agencies the time to put together a budget. Um, the second year would give us time to provide oversight and for the agencies to provide for more effective implementation um, following the mission of those agencies and programs. Um, you know, I, I was a legislator in New Hampshire. I was on the Finance Committee in our State Senate. I was governor for three terms, put together three biennial budgets. I'm now in the United States Senate, so I've had to s the opportunity to see this process work from a variety of perspectives. And I can tell you that even though New Hampshire is a small state, if we look at the 19 states that have biennial budgets, um, they're small states, large states, geographically all over this country. But the challenges are the same for all of us. It's the same challenge we have at the federal level when it comes to budgeting. How do we prioritize scarce resources? How do we make sure that we most effectively operate programs and the mission that we're trying to accomplish at the federal level? And how do we get the best bang for every taxpayer dollar? And biennial budgeting is an opportunity for us 
I think, to do a better job of how we're budgeting. So we're pleased. This is the only the beginning. We will continue to work on this legislation to hopefully get a lot of co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle. And I think it's important that, as Senator Isaacson said, um, we weren't just dates at the State of the Union the other night. Um, we're working together to try and move this Senate and this country forward. Thank you. Yes, sir. I uh, think you're going to try to push this uh, as part of the debt ceiling increase. Is there an agency an opportunity to try to see if this is enacted as part of that debate? I am talking in my conference, and I'm sure that uh, Senator Shaheen is talking in her conference uh, about uh, the prioritization of this issue. Time is of the essence. You know, the moment of truth is here. That was the title of the, rec the report from the De from Deficit Commission yesterday's estimate by CBO that we'll have a deficit this year of $1.48 trillion is unacceptable and unsustainable. Uh, and we and changing the process is obviously part of doing it. I, I, I say in my back home, in fact, I made a speech on this Monday, and I use this example. Every American family in the last three years, everyone in this room, everyone back home has had to sit around the kitchen table and reprioritize the way they spend their money in their household. Because I've done it. You know, when I came to Congress and left my private business, I had dividends and real estate and rents. Well, things have changed in real estate and dividends. And because of that, I've reprioritized, my wife and I have done our reprioritization because we've got to live within our means. But the United States government, the government that has forced everybody to live within their means and as families, looks the other way when it comes to accountability, responsibility, and appropriating. I think this is the magic year for us to make some significant changes in the process and the way we do business. And it has to be done in a bipartisan way. But this is a debt's a bipartisan problem. It's been contributed to on both sides of the aisle. It's going to lame, it's going to hamstring future presidents regardless of their party. And it's time the United States Congress did what the American people have had to do in difficult and tough economic times. Can you see holding up the, the vote on a debt ceiling to try to improve I'm not going to take anything off the table, nor am I going to start making predictions about what I can and cannot do. I'm just saying this is the most this legislation may in and of itself not be the most important, but this addressing the debt and the deficit is the most important job that we face, and I personally will be willing to use whatever vehicle is necessary to get it debated on the floor of the United States Senate and get it to a vote. And I, I share that, um, that it's the statement that I'm not going to make a decision right now on what I'm going to do, but that this is an important one of the pieces that we've got to look at as we're thinking about how we do business. Senator Shaheen, have you talked to the uh, Democratic leadership um, about whether to put this on their radar whatsoever? Um, I haven't. I expect to. Can I get away from politics for a minute? I think like Senator Isaacson's quote, go, I can see his quote could be Was it a good one? Oh, it must have been a bad one. No, you're saying I'm not going to take anything off the table. It's on process or substance or because that quote begs a lot of questions. Well, what, you know, the question that I was responding to, you're going to make it a condition of the debt ceiling. And, I, you know, I don't, th I don't think there is no question for me, and I, I'll speak for myself. I, I'll let Jean speak for herself on this. There's no question that the debt, debt ceiling vote is going to be a contentious vote and it's going to be a conditional vote. And by a conditional vote, I mean there are many members on both sides of the aisle that are probably going to have conditions to their support of that piece of legislation. Whether process or, or, or any other item is a condition is yet to be determined. But I personally will not support the debt ceiling increase without a movement uh, towards addressing the significant problem that causes us to have to look at the debt ceiling in the first place. And, and I vote against debt ceiling increases under Bush, President Bush and President Obama, and I voted for them. But this, we're at a time now, we're at a moment of truth. So I don't want to take anything off the table in terms of issues I might think should be a condition of that vote. And one of them may very well be this, but I'm not laying that marker down today. The reason I ask is, you know, there's been a lot of talk about process, and we've sat in here and listened to other proposals, but people are not talking substance. What's off the table? Medicare, Social Security, defense? Get us some specifics. Well, that's, that's another question, and I'll be very specific, and I don't want to hog all the time here, but. I'm a, okay. I'm, I'm a perfect right. example of what we need to do, and you'll love this one. But don't forget when you write about it, write about the biennial budget, okay? <laughs> although this is, right, although no, no, I gave up on that a long time ago. 
Um, look, not by you, of course. I was born on December the 28th, 1944. In 1983, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill went to the White House when the Social Security Administration reported it was going broke in the out years. They sat down and Reagan said, well, I'm not going to vote to raise the payroll tax. And O'Neill said, I'm not cutting benefits. And they looked to the actuaries and said, what do we do? They said change eligibility in the out years, and so they ultimately came to a decision to say anybody body born after 1943 up until 1947 is no longer eligible for Social Security at 65, they become eligible at 66. And then it changed the formula in the other years to move it to ultimately be age 67. The Debt and Deficit Commission recommended a continuation of that movement to ultimately be the age of 69 by 2075. We have got to address that, and, and if you look at, look, I'm, I'm not talking about somebody else's situation, I'm talking about me, and when I was 39 years old in 1983, I didn't think I was going to make it to 65, and my father had always said, son, the government will never have enough money, you better save your own, and I've told my children the same thing, because you've got to count on yourself, but we have an opportunity to, to save the Social Security system and its beneficiaries without raising the payroll tax and without... Um, cutting the benefit. You might need to reform the COLA process. I'll put that in there in terms of the benefit, but that's not a cut in a benefit. It's a change in process. Any, anybody that takes Medicare and Social Security off the table and the entire entitlement issue when it comes to debt and deficit is taking off two-thirds of the ability to solve the problem because they are two-thirds of the expenditures of the United States government and they're on cruise control. And we owe it to my grandchildren we owe it to the children of America today to look into the out years and say, we want a Social Security that's there for you. And it's going to take some changes because lives have changed. People live longer. People work longer. People do things longer. I don't take anything off the table. And the first thing you put on the table are those things that are relatively underlined and put in quotes relatively easy to solve. So they did Social Security with me in 1983. We can do it today for my grandchildren in 2011. Let me just add, I think it's not productive right now to talk about which program any individual thinks we should cut or not cut. Um, but as Senator Isaacson said, we've got to be willing to look at all of government spending, the Defense Department, as well as entitlements, and we've also got to look at governor, government's revenue. So we've got to look at the tax system as well. And I was pleased to see that the Deficit Reduction Commission that the President set up did both of those things. And while I don't agree with all of their recommendations, I think they started a discussion that has to be continued because this is a problem we've got to address. Um, I have been part of many of those meetings. I have not floated this idea with them. I don't know if you have, Johnny. I've been a part of some of those meetings, and Senator Chambliss is going to be a co-sponsor. That He's already notified us to be a co-sponsor, and I would, I can't speak for Governor Warner, but uh, former Governor Warner, but we have, uh, we have talked about a lot of things together. I, I think that, I think the Deficit and Debt Commission is one of the truly breakthrough moments for all of us if we will not put it in the closet or put it on the shelf. It, it allows shared sacrifice. Uh, it's very prospective. Uh, it's, it's very positive. Sure, there's some things people might not like to do in it, but taken collectively, it, it, it takes a huge bite out of the debt and the deficit. It changes the whole paradigm. And, and, and rep Recommendation 6.4 is for us to look at the budget concepts under which we now operate, talking about the process, and that was part of what they said. So, I, in fact, they said um, fix, reduce spending, reform taxation, fix entitlements, and change the process. Those were the four principal concepts of the Deficit Commission report. So I hope a lot of people on both sides of the aisle will join us. Yes. Sorry, can you talk a little more about the bipartisan talks, um, looking to translate some of the fiscal commission's uh, recommendations into legislation? Well, I think is. How long are they? I, I think they're at the point where they're ready to introduce legislation. Um, I think, again, using the blueprint from the Deficit Commission's report for that legislation, but I think there's still a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of um, 
effort that's going to be involved in building some consensus for how we go forward. The legislation is complete or near near completion? Or? Uh, my understanding is that it's they're still working on it. They have not submitted it yet, but you know we just opened that process this week. So I commend them on their work. I look forward to seeing the final product and, and have periodically been in those meetings to try and contribute to them. Um, we're in the process of talking to people right now, so. Yeah, we, we, uh, we've got a lot of interest, and we've got uh, five or six on our side that responded the first day to the Dear Colleagues. So. Five or six, um, in the, in the Democratic John Thune, uh, Mike Crapo, Saxby Chambliss, Lamar Alexander, by example. But this is the, it's going, it's being dropped today, and this, this is the maiden press conference of what I hope will be continuing conversation on the Hill about the, the legislation. So. Well, thank you for coming, thank and you. thank you, Governor Shaheen, Senator Shaheen, very yes. much. Thank you. Thank you for braving the snow.